go live here. There we go, and live. There we go. Okay. And we are live. Good. All right, we'll begin the talk in just a minute or two here once everything is ready to go. All right, let's begin. So you might have heard of the concept of serialization or deserialization before, but if you're kind of curious what exactly that means and how that differs from, say, just you know, printing out data in an array, well, that's what we're digging into today. So serialization is the process of turning an object into data. So importantly, that's not just like turning a string into a, you know, putting into a file or printing out a number. This is an actual language construct here, you know, like a Java object, you know, a Python object. And deserialization will turn that data back into the original object. So unlike something like just, you know, JSON, for example, we are encoding entire objects here. So, you know, JSON could store, for example, a Python dictionary. It could, you know, hold most of the things that a dictionary could hold. But it couldn't by itself, for example, say, oh, this is this is an array of you know Python objects of this type with these specific values and in this interesting internal state. Serialization, on the other hand, can do that. So that makes it really useful. You know, we can use it to make data persistent. It's a lot easier to do that if you don't have to think about actually restoring and, you know, encoding it. If you can just say, well, just take my data, put it away, and then pull it back out later, exactly as I left it. It's also great for inter-process communication. You can send actual, you know, objects back and forth. I believe this is very popular in Java for, you know, passing commands around, you know, in case you need to send your abstract singleton proxy factory being across the, you know, to your server, you can just serialize it, toss it over, deserialize it. Thirdly, it is amazing for getting pwned. So, what's Pickle? It is a Python deserialization module. It's the vanilla way to handle kind of moving data in and out of Python. And it can handle most Python objects, not just data structures, as we mentioned. And it's, it's cross-compatible between versions. So just as a quick example here, um, you might notice the unusual print statement here, but this is just taking a little class A as a, a secure flag, you know, to make it hack proof, of course, and we can dump that to a string, dumps, so dump string, and that will give us a string representation of the object. And this is how you're meant to use it. And as I mentioned, these examples are from a couple years back. They are still quite relevant, and you can uh, pop calculators to your heart's content, even in Python 3 in 2021. So no need to fear. So straight from the documentation, like the first thing on the page is a gigantic red flag you know, warning the pickle module is not secure. So what does that mean, though? Uh, well, one interpretation is that it is Turing complete. It will do anything. But how does it do anything? You know, it feels like you, you have to like to, to, to program things. You, need, you know, turn complete systems. You need a programming language. Fortunately, Pickle delivers. It is a stack-based language which runs in the beautifully named Pickle virtual machine, and it can interact with the currently running Python process. So, it can create and push Python objects onto the stack. It can store and call Python functions. Think about, okay, so if it can do all those things, what happens when you give it untrusted input? Well, you get the beautiful three-word acronym. Arbitrary code execution, or ACE, I suppose. It's usually remote. RCE, you might see it. But either way, it's not good. So I want a shell. I have a pickle. What do I do? Well, 
what we can do is actually construct entirely by hand a malicious pickle uh, string and then run it. So, first opcode we care about is C for callable. It reads in a module name and a callable name and pushes that to the stack. So, for example, C OS system. You can probably see where this one's going. So, there's our pickle so far. And these new lines are important, by the way. It won't work if you just jam it all into one line. So, the left paren is just a little marker. It'll come up in a second. And S, capital S, is for a string, which will let us take a string and shove it on the stack. And then T is for tuple, or tuple. Let's go with tuple. It will throw values off the stack until it finds a marker, and then it pushes the resulting tuple onto the stack. <clears throat> so, let's start a tuple. Let's put a string, like Benis H. That sounds good. Then a little T. That's our tuple. Now, all that's left here is the icing on the cake, the thing that actually causes all the pain and suffering, R for reduce. It will pop a tuple and a module.callable pair and invoke it. I, I agree with the original author. This is a fantastic idea. And then we push the result. And then finally, dot will end the pickle. So there we go. That is our malicious pickle. So this causes some problems. Let's just run through it, though, before we do it live, because that's always fun. So here is our input, and here is the stack, and we're just going to run through it as it scans through the input and, you know, runs our little malicious program. So shove OS, you know, that system on the stack. We start creating a tuple. We put binistation in the stack. We hit T, so we pop off the stack until we uh, hit the open paren. That goes in the stack. We call reduce os.system nsh. And suffering ensues. We can actually do this ourselves here. I have a little pre made example because I don't want to make a typo live. Now we go ahead. So if I just go into my Windows terminal here and just do, you know, see os system open tuple calc.exe and tuple reduce. And excellent. We can do all of our important calculator operations. So yeah, pickles are basically arbitrary code execution. It's, it's basically a pretentious form of eval, if you, uh, if you think about it. And so it's true. As they said, pickle is not secure. You absolutely must not pass untrusted input into it unless you like giving free shells to people on the internet. So here's some other opcodes just for the sake of, you know, completeness. You know, I will read an integer. L will produce a list, kind of like how tuples are made. Same thing with dict. It just uses alternating key value pairs. And we can also just push an empty tuple directly. So that pops a shell, but what if we want to do some other stuff? Well, we can do interesting things like uh, get adder to actually uh, pull a particular attribute out of something. We can dump the contents of a file, you know, by using get adder to actually get the read function and just run it. We could read locals, you know, we could, we could do all sorts of things. But you think about it, I mentioned it's kind of fancy eval, but what if we really want it to just be eval? Because handwriting pickles gets kind of annoying. And I don't want to write pickles, I want to write Python. And fortunately, it's pretty straightforward to construct a magic universal pickle. So all it does is it's going to take some Python code and run it. So we need a few pieces here. Uh, one is the Marshall module, which is another great idea. Uh, it allows us to take Python bytecode and turn it back into a function, as well as go from func you know, a function to a string. So you might know that if you use the double underscore code uh, attribute on something, you will actually get a code object, which you can then, you know, inspect to see stuff like arguments and logo and all that fun stuff. Uh, really fun for jailbreak challenges, I might, I might add. We can actually get a string of that and then I'll load it in later. Then the types module can create a function out of that code object. All we have to do is just say, give it the code, give it the, you know, globals we want it to have, give it a name, Python function. Easy. 
And then we just need base 64 so that we're not sending gobbledygook over the wire. So all we really got to do here to produce the malicious contents is to take our function we want to run, get its code, dump it, and code it. That's easy. And then we just need a pickle to actually run it for us. And it should be pretty easy to walk through this. So we say, OK, we, we take type.function type. Then we're going to say, OK, then it's going to get called. We're going to give it a tuple. And that tuple contains a callable marshal.loads. And we give that a tuple, which is base64, b64 decode. And that is given a tuple uh, that just contains you know, that little string we made. And we just build our tuples up, reduce, reduce, give it the globals, and run it. So this is all this thing really does. You know, decode, load the function, make a function given that code, the, the globals are, you know, whatever the program has already, and doesn't need a name, you know. You could give it a funny name like, you know, leave if you wanted to. So we now have arbitrary code execution. We can just, whatever we want, we just shove it into the server. It runs it for us. Job to good them. Days ruined. So how do we deal with this? Uh, step one, you never unpickle user input, ever. It's just a bad idea. It's, it's basically one step removed from handing someone a Python console. So if you instead use JSON to store whatever data you care about, that means that even if the user is malicious, they can't really make your program to start running arbitrary code. They could give you bogus input. They can make your program malfunction, but they can't make it actually do evil stuff. And the important thing there is that that's separating your code from your data. I kind of bang on this about every single talk I give, but almost every single like security exploit is, at least a lot of them, are caused by the conflation of that data with that code. And serialization is making it possible to actually mix those up, especially in the case of Python with its fantastic reduce operator, which still remains completely terrifying to me. But yeah, so let's go ahead a bit. So moving on, we're going to talk about another language. And you, you probably know that Python is a popular language, but what's a more popular language? You know, maybe one that's run on like Billions of devices? Yes, Java. A favorite of code monkeys everywhere, producing infinitely deep layers of enterprise lasagna. So it's a good language. So Java's D serialization isn't quite as exciting as Python's. We cannot just hand it a hello world, you know, line and tell, hey, run this. It's a bit smarter than that. So when you serialize stuff in Java, of course, there's a bunch of camel case between us and the actual fun stuff here. But the gist is you, you take an object, you have it serialized to some output stream, and then you take some data from an input stream and convert it back to an object. And by default, there's not really any limitations on serialization or deserialization. Like, you'll just, you'll just read whatever. But there is an important caveat. Whatever you're deserializing must be on the class path. So it must be a class that is available. Like if you were writing code, you could, you know, create a new instance of it. So we couldn't just, you know, write our own class and say, here, here's, you know, evil dot, you know, evil object. Just construct one of those for me, you know, honest. No, we have to do something with what we already have. So in this case, we are kind of only serializing data, not, you know, code necessarily because you know what we're doing here is saying okay here's the description of a string object here's a description of you know uh, an array list object and we can't actually just say okay now run evil.exe we can't do that probably so you might remember we've talked about constant things like rop or return oriented programming so we, we use that in situations where we can't just write our own code. You know, the system will not let us just execute random garbage on the stack. What we can do, though, is trick it into doing stuff for us by building up a series of gadgets, little bits of code that run, then return somewhere else, that runs, then return somewhere else, on and on and on. So the same premise kind of comes up here. We want to find some interesting trademark code on the class path and find a way to make it execute. So when we're deserializing, either read object or read resolve get called. 
So read object is the thing that if you want to manually control how your object gets, you know, deserialized, you have to influence it in there. And read resolve also allows you to just, uh, you know, do stuff after the object is completely loaded. Uh, you know, so it might be useful to like replace it with an instance of a different class or something like that. So these are operating on user provided data. You know, we're assuming it was kind of taking stuff that it received and just, you know, trying to deserialize it. So, what if they do something dangerous? So, welcome to uh, CVE 2013-2186. This is the Apache Commons file upload uh, library, which is, it makes it very easy to add file upload capabilities to your server. Unfortunately, it also enables arbitrary file uploads. So, it was possible to just create a temp file at some user-given location, but unfortunately, it if you added a null byte at the end, it would just terminate the resulting path. It wouldn't add anything else onto the end, so you can get completely arbitrary file names. That was a problem. But that's not remote code execution. That's just, you know, it's just messing with files. You know, that's a little boring. Um, so we really want to get remote code execution. But if all we have to work with is data, then how can we, if, how can we get that? Now, Fortunately, uh, Java does have a way to do this. Reflection. Might be sending shivers down the spines of some students right now. Reflection is, it's a bit of a dark art. It allows us to actually kind of introspect and you know, look at code at runtime. So we can, for example, get fields and methods by name. We can also look up classes by name, bypass a lot of access control stuff, void your warranty, she has the foot. And the problem with reflection is it suddenly starts getting a little closer to working with code here. We're actually getting functions, we're giving arguments, that kind of thing. We can do that entirely with data. So this wound up being the underpinning for a pretty nasty bug in the Apache Commons uh, collections library. Uh, you might notice that Apache Commons has come up twice now and uh, it turns out when you have a very popular, very widely used library, it becomes extremely useful to be able to, you know, get remote code execution on it. So they've had quite a few things pulled up for them. They're also quite complex. And as we'll see here, uh, we wind up with a very kind of weird chain of behaviors that leads to code execution. So one of its features is lazy map, which can, uh, you can stick it on another map and it can actually like, you know, transform the values you put in it and, you know, otherwise just make it possible to compute stuff ahead of time or later on, you know, lets you be lazy. And there's a couple options for transformers, including this very exciting invoker transformer. And if we just have a quick look at this payload setup here, uh, you might notice that this interesting sequence here, uh, constant transformer, runtime class, then, oh, invoker transformer, get method, oh, get, get runtime, and that's not some dangerous. Uh, invoke, exec, oh, yeah. Sounds dangerous. So what this will wind up doing is quite clever. And uh, the specifics of this aren't terribly important for this talk, so we will just uh, skim over a little bit. But we wind up constructing this, this kind of classical Java sequence of like 10 layers of abstraction, where we have a invocation handler for a proxy to our lazy map, and it's, you know, again, seven layer bean dip going on here. But what winds up happening is we send this thing over to the, you know, the victim, and it will then try to read the thing. And that, that read object method will look through all the keys on the proxy and see if they need to be set up. They might be missing their values. And the lazy map will eventually wind up trying to look up a key with that name. It doesn't exist. So it can then say, okay, well, I don't have that value, so I better go set this thing up. We'll add a new key. And as a result, it invokes the transformers. Now, because the transformers use reflection, they can actually just address methods entirely, you know, they can just pull in methods you want. And this is all part of the actual object we sent over. So suddenly, we do have code execution. It runs transformers, it will wind up grabbing your runtime, getting the, you know, running exec, runs calc, and we have a free calculator. So this is pretty convoluted, and that's kind of where that, you know, that gadget thing comes from. We're actually putting together multiple different little interesting bits of the program to result in some unsafe behavior. 
So really, we just have to find something that lets us run code. And this makes it pretty dangerous because, you know, it could be one, one of the libraries you use. It could be one of the libraries they use. As long as they exist anywhere on the class path, you're in trouble. And if you want to see some historical examples, I, I suggest looking at the Why So Serial repository. It talks about some uh, various, you know, options. A lot of things for collections, actually. There's other stuff in there, too. You know, Groovy and uh, Rose was? No, that's what it was. It's quite a few. Uh, yes, here's actually a whole list of them. You know, you see that we have uh, seven different ways to attack collections, including two relatively new ones. Uh, but yeah, Clojure had, had one, you know. And so it's, and again, to reiterate that, it doesn't mean you're using the dangerous functionality. It means you could use the dangerous things. And that's what makes it insidious. So how do we fix this? Uh, so you probably know the answer already, but let's go through some of the less useful answers first. Well, we could blacklist the problematic classes. Like, what if we just say, okay, you can't, you can't deserialize these anymore. Well, the problem with that is you might just find another one. Because, you know, again, there were seven different ways to exploit comments. Uh, alternatively, you could whitelist the classes you actually expect to deserialize. So if you're doing some inter-process communication here and you're like, okay, I'm only ever going to receive this one specific thing, then you can actually tell it, just say, okay, look at the class name. If it is not the one I expect, just don't deserialize it. Yep, that's good, but it is tedious. You can also actually run the deserialization process in a security context uh, that is very restrictive. So you can actually say, okay, you just can't do any of these evil things. You, you can only like build an object. But you can run into problems if the nasty behavior happens later. Like if, for example, the finalize method happens to be, be vulnerable, then you can actually have it just go off whenever the garbage collector claims it. But Ultimately, the solution here is to just never deserialize untrusted data. Just don't do it. We did invent asymmetric cryptography for a reason. You can sign your objects, you know, just don't let people modify them. We didn't even talk about the more kind of trivial stuff like just editing pickles so that they can say, oh yes, I am the admin now. That is this trivial stuff and that is also mitigated by just signing or, you know, properly encrypting your data. So, to wrap things up here, Python just immediately shoots you in the foot if you deserialize uh, trusted data. You can literally just run code. It's actually pretty funny. I was surprised by how straightforward it was. Uh, by comparison, Java allows any of your dependencies to shoot you in the foot, or any of their dependencies, you know, recursively. So, you can get in trouble there. And since we didn't talk about PHP today, we always have to make fun of PHP, it's a bit like Java. You can't just run code, but there are, it is possible for you, like, your wake up and destruct functions, which, which happen when the object comes to life and dies. They can have similar issues to what we had in Java. If they have some unsafe behavior, you know, if they use reflection or any kind of similar premise, or they do dangerous things with user data, like a trivial example just is eval, you know, some data on the object, then you can indeed get code execution. Because the important thing there is these are functions that are forcibly called when the object comes to life or dies. So that means that we, if, we put a, if we can get logic to happen in there, then problems happen. So that wraps up the slides for today. Uh, if you'd like to join us to hear about future talks and generally talk about you know, interesting security things or just ridiculous shit posting, uh, check out the Slack. It's at rpasec.slack.com. And let's see, and that wraps things up. So thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you here next week. And you'll now see my desktop for a second. Oh,